folks. This is Noelle Cockett. I'm president of Utah State University. And my, it's great pleasure to invite you to the question and answer session of our Blue Plate Research Program. We're very, very excited about those of you who are able to join us for the presentation of our three researchers, as well as the question and answer session today. And we have a very broad group with us. We have state and local government people, health and medicine, nonprofit organizations, business and educators. Um, we're just so pleased that we have been able to de develop a program that you have found of interest. Now, our Blue Plate Research Program has actually evolved from something you may have participated in before, and that was our Sunrise Session. This uh, Sunrise Session had been held for 14 years. Uh, as depicted by the name, it was a breakfast session. And like our Blue Plate Research Program, it was also sponsored by Regents. Uh, but as we began to look at new programming for the Sunrise Session, we realized that we would like to disperse our programming, our information from Utah State in a much further uh, sector of the state of Utah. The other thing that we came to realize is that our people are very eager for information on health and well being. In fact, uh, given that our partners are regions, it makes so much sense to have our focus in this new program the Blue Plate Research Program to hone in on that. And no better uh, group institution to do health and well being than Utah State University. It turns out we have over 130 faculty who are actively engaged in different aspects of health and well being. And through this Blue Plate Special, we'll be uh, offering them opportunities and a venue to share with you their findings, uh, their conclusions, and their recommendations. Um, in today's program, as you know, we focused on mental health and well being. And we hope that you enjoyed uh, the scripted part of our program. And we're now going to have a uh, opportunity for questions and answers from our experts. To lead us into that um, part of the program, I'd like to turn it over to Jim Swayze, President of Regents. Thank you, President Cockett. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Jim Swayze. I am President of Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Utah. President Cockett, it's great to see you even remotely and, and everyone else on, on the call. Um, you know, this has been really such a rewarding partnership, which I think you outlined evolving from Sunrise Sessions, President Cockett, into what we're now calling Blue Plate Research. And we're just so excited to launch this today. Um, you know, we, we continue to applaud the innovative and creative research that's done up there at Utah State University. You know, you're a leading university, and it's great to get this message out more to more U Utahns. And I think rethinking this during the COVID-19 to utilize things like Zoom and utilize new ways to get this out is very innovative. And I wanna congratulate President Cockett, your team and working in collaboration with my team to, to really rethink this event. Um, I wanna also thank everyone for joining us today. Everyone is so very busy. You know, we talked about, um, you know, therapies and stress, but everyone is being pulled in so many different directions right now. And, um, you know, I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to really tune in. Um, you know, the stress is right now out there. I, I think even by 2020 standards, when I saw the brain eating amoeba yesterday, I think that was even harsh for 2020 standards yesterday uh, when I saw that. So I think this is a very topical way to kind of kick this off. You know, we, we all at times, I think through this, you know, and through life can feel like some of the joy is being taken from us. 
And I think today's message was really sound. You know, for me personally, I grew up with horses. So when I was looking at some of those beautiful animals, um, it, it reminded me of a lot of the joy. Now, I didn't really think about cleaning the stalls in the morning before I went to school and having horse manure on my shoes and things like that. I, that, that part, you know, kind of moved out of my brain, but I thought about the beauty of those animals. Um, and music equally for me is one of my great passions. Um, if you ask me what is one of the things I miss um, mostly besides interacting with people, it's live music. You know, I would go to a lot of concerts and a lot of shows. Um, so I think having these new types of, of therapies and just being exposed to them is just so very important. And again, very happy that USU um, is willing to do that and kind of share their gifts. Um, I'm going to transition now, um, as President Cockett said, to the to the Q and A. Um, and what I would say is, this is one of my favorite parts: is is actually having direct access to these brilliant researchers and being able to ask them questions. Um, I always think I'm asking a smart question, and they just answer them just so easily and and just so wonderfully. So I think this is really a great part of things. So don't um, be shy about asking questions. Um, I would say that they're very interactive. Most of these researchers don't bite either, um, so they'll answer these questions in a, in a very thoughtful way. So. Um, as you can see, for me, one of my stressful things is to try to inject humor, even if it's marginal, to try to lighten the mood and, and, and have some fun with everything. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Wyatt. And again, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield is so thankful uh, to be partners with you, President Cockett, um, and uh, launch this for everyone. Wyatt, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, President Swayze and President Cockett. I also love getting to ask our researchers questions. Um, even if it makes me feel like an idiot, I'm happy to be the idiot um, in the room around our researchers. We have so much additional stuff that we weren't able to cover in the YouTube video you already saw. And so I'm excited to hear your questions today. If you have a question, please um, put it in the chat and make sure to include um, the organization that you're with. To get us started, Started. Um, ooh, sorry. To get us started, uh, my first question is: For decades, there has been a negative stigma keeping people from seeking support, despite nearly half of us experiencing some sort of challenge. How have you seen um, this change? And I think that we're going to start with Mike. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be a part of this and to hear about uh, different innovative ways we're getting mental health out there. And I think that starts to speak to the issues of stigma that, you know, as we uh, continue to tackle the mental health challenges we're facing, especially in the midst of the pandemic, um, I think that we're increasingly doing a better job of uh, normalizing that mental health concerns are common, that this is part of the human experience, um, that many people seek help and that you know, seeking help can be of quite benefit to people. And so I, I do feel like we see more and more messaging out there as a, as a culture and in our communities. And I really uh, am uh, heartened to see that. Uh, I think one place we get stuck is it's easy to say, um, mental health stigma is really prevalent. Nobody seeks care, seeking care is stigmatized. And that actually sets the wrong norm message. We start to actually communicate this isn't common. And I think over time, we've taken a more affirming stance and just seen how common both these concerns are, but then also how treatable they are uh, through a variety of different uh, avenues. Okay, Judy, what have you seen? You know, within the, the veterans population, it's very common for that warrior ethos to be strong and tough and, and not want to seek help. Although the military in the last um, decade has done very well about focusing on wellness and resiliency, I find just having it just be an entry point to come be a part of a wellness program and not so much as a treatment because treatment can be a stepping off. Um, one of the most innovative things that we did out of necessity was last fall, um, the funding that we had received from the VA um, came a little late and we needed to get as many um, veterans engaged as possible. And by just offering a very casual luncheon and meet and greet for them to see the facility up here and to see the herd and perhaps maybe just consider the 
possibility of engaging in some type of therapeutic approach with a horse, that was wonderful and well received. And we were quickly on the way prior to COVID to achieving our outcomes in that area. All right. And Dr. Hearns, what have you seen? Oh no, did I freeze? Sorry about that. I, I think I'm okay now. Um, I do believe we've seen a paradigm shift over the last probably decade or more. There's been more emphasis on, on wellness, on mindfulness living, on communities that are building more access for their citizens to be outside, to be recreating in healthy ways and taking better care of themselves. And because of that, I think we're seeing some of the stigma that's been associated with mental health and that that tough outer casing that Judy's talking about that so many people, you know, you just want to pull up your boot strings and hang in there with regardless of what's going on. But I, I think people are tending to be more amenable and more, uh, more desirous of reaching out and seeking the help that they need. And I truly believe that many of these allied health professions and these alternative therapies that we're seeing come, come into the viewpoint now are more, um, they're more favorable with people. They're more, they're not that, that stigmatized set of you're in therapy now and this is what it looks like, but it's, it's so much, liber it's so liberating and so free and full of expression and different ways of approaching the same, the same dilemmas or problems that people may have had. So I do believe we are seeing a, a positive paradigm shift. Awesome, okay. I, next, um, we have a question from Jason Jacobs from the Council for Sustainable Healing. Um, if he's here, if you can get ready to talk. And then after he gives his question, Mike, would you start answering it? Are you here, Jason? I am, thank you. Um, I got one of my heroes in the back. Ground. It just happened to be like a, uh, well, it was already present there, but uh, one of the best virtual teachers on the planet in the history, Mr. Rogers, did everything virtually. Um, so I really I love everything that's been shared. Um, I have a concern. I think one of my concerns is, is that I think the accessibility to good effective tools and therapy um, is so much worse than, uh, there's there's so many obstacles um, in terms of um, cost, um, um, regional um, and physical access, um, stigma, emotional kind of barriers, people keeping you know, uh, kind of being more stuck. So I love, and I agree with the things that were said and uh, needing to be accessible, but also having people um, engaged, professionals engaged um, in, in the process and the healing process. And, and that still seems extremely limited in how many people are gonna even have access to, to any kind of interaction. I think like, you know, teletherapy, um, is going to greatly increase that and needs to continue. But I feel like um, to really reach the magnitude of people that are suffering that are not getting any access, like there, I feel like there needs to be a, a fundam, like, I don't know if a basic yeah. model shift, but at least an additional, I need to wrap this up, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> can, are there thoughts on like how to make some of these things uh, or would would people be open to yeah. collaborating how, how to make these more um, accessible on more on like a community type format, almost kind of like AA type style um, is something I'm trying to um, explore with with people in my council and just yeah. resources. Mike. 
Wonderful. Those are all great points. And I think this is such an important topic and a unifying theme about how do we increase access through different avenues. Um, my favorite thinking on the topic is if we think of mental health as a public health challenge, the scope of human suffering, the prevalence, that we think of maybe the solutions as a portfolio of options to reach different segments of the population in different scalable formats for different target problems. Um, and I think that in part involves thinking of humans holistically, like diet, exercise, um, uh, equine assisted therapy, music therapy. There's so many avenues that we can improve mental health and well being. On the technology side, um, I've been so appreciative of President Cockett, who supported um, at USU uh, making ACCID available uh, to USU students. And, and I just think that's a really uh, useful model. So I wanted to highlight it because um, we launched it last December and we've had over 800 students sign up, which is, is really a high percent, uh, and a notable percent of our student body. It's reaching a lot of people. And part of why I wanted to mention it is because it's, I have the field of dreams kind of problem. If you build it, will they come? And what we see with tech as one example of increasing access is just building it isn't enough. We need to really integrate this into communities. So like at USU, we've had a, a very integrated approach in how we launched the tech. And I think that's made all the difference because I've seen some universities struggle there. Um, and I think that you've really rightly pointed out that we have a lot of underserved communities. And I think similarly with all this variety, you know, in our portfolio of service options, integrate the, integrating that into our communities more is so key. Um, yeah. So those are my Mike, thoughts. Yeah, Mike, could you be a little more specific about how you're integrating those here at USU and how we're being a little more, how things are being done differently than at other universities? And then after you finish up that, I think we have a question from Amy Kahn from Regents. Wonderful. Yes. So from a few perspectives, um, just briefly to tag it, um, I've talked to several universities and researchers where we've really struggled, for example, in college student mental health here. Um, it's been pretty common to launch an online mental health program and get fairly low uptake um, in, in a you know, very small percentage using it. Um, things that we've done at USU um, through President Caucus direction, um, going through like our, our uh, centralized marketing has made a big difference, like posting on our My USU main page, that's a really big draw. A really big one um, is uh, thinking about integrating this into systems of care. So our counseling center has been a major source of referrals and Scott Deberard has been really key in moving that forward. And then also through other kind of communities within our community um, and, and the different divisions that work there. So James Morales and Student Affairs, they've done a lot of work in various branches to reach out to students. So I, I think it's really kind of getting out to the communities it, that's been uh, quite helpful for doing that. Awesome. Amy? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question about uh, equine therapy. You know, we've seen numerous studies to reflect that, you know, emotional support and relief of anxiety, depression symptoms can be readily achieved when people have a relationship with animals. And predominantly that's, you know, our pets, our cats and our dogs, and they are definitely loving support for many. Is there any data to suggest that equine therapy somehow works any differently? I'm, a, I, I'm not a horse person <laughs> and like Jim, but um, I just, I would be curious if there's that same sort of, uh, you know, connection that happens with a horse that we have seen uh, in terms of the therapeutic relationship people have mostly with their pets. Well, I'll be able to take that for you. Um, unfortunately, we are weak on providing that really rigorous research to indicate about the dynamic of the relationship. But what's unique other than other species in this symbiotic relationship, the horse is a prey animal. And it's really kind of a question of neuroscience. The horse as a prey animal does not have a prefrontal cortex. And yet a lot of the people we engage, their conditions can and be engaged that prefrontal cortex, you know, so that executive functioning, that, you know, that ability to understand themselves and how they relate with others. And so that's really the direction that we are going. We're laying the foundation to explore in our research is how does this symbiotic relationship where um, in order to even relate to a prey animal, you have to invoke some empathy. A person has to Kind of get out of themselves and consider another another species that actually is very relational as a herd animal they're hardwired to connect um, for them to be alone equals death and so there's that strong um, sense of you know you are another species and you might be a predator but 
somehow I want to connect with you. And so that's kind of the dichotomy that we set up the experience so we can begin laying the foundation of cultivating a bond. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I think we have a question from Susan Anderson, but right, but, but while we're waiting for her to unmute herself, um, I just want to say that you should like listen to Judy's episode of Instead because you get to learn so much about her story and it's just wonderful um, how Judy got involved with equine assisted therapy. And I just, I'm so proud that I got to um, help make that with you. Okay, Susan Anderson, are you here? I am. Um, hey. I just wondered, is singing as good as playing instruments for therapy? And what if you're afraid of horses? Okay, okay Maureen? Um, yeah, thank you, Susan, for your question. Singing is certainly therapeutic by all means. Um, if the client's goals might be as a form of expression or community involvement, or even a physiological goal of increasing lung capacity, singing and playing instruments are both going to meet that particular need. Sometimes for personal healing, I, I have found that maybe singing is a more intimate form of communication and self-expression. I wouldn't necessarily that one is more beneficial than the other. I would definitely agree that they are both beneficial within the, within the context of the goals that we're addressing with the client, for sure. Okay, and Judy, what do you do when people are scared of horses? Well, first of all, having a healthy respect for a thousand pound animal is a good thing. Um, but this fear factor, uniquely in our collaboration with the Salt Lake City VA, we're launching on a pilot project where we're creating virtual reality equine experiences. So we're taking the aspects of our program, putting it in a VR reality with the technology, even to the point that we have a, a, a tech company that is wanting to have us utilize um, gloves, sensor gloves that could also relay that sense of touch because touch is very significant in the forming of attachment and developing relationships. So um, one platform for those that maybe have that fear and anxiety about the big animal, or perhaps they just don't have the mobility issues you know, available because of their condition, they're not able to engage in a horse. With a horse, this virtual reality is going to kind of help us test to see virtually does it have the same impact on an individual as if they were truly there engaging with the horse. Oh, that's exciting. Okay, Mike, we're going to have a question for you from Layla Gwynn from American Fork Development Counseling. Um, so, Layla, take it away. Hi, Dr. Levin. Um, last fall, I attended um, Dr. Tuig's um, training, two-day training on ACT um, through the Sorensen Clinical um, Center. And I also um, signed on to the ACT guide and was able to use it myself. Um, I was more interested on, I'm a clinical mental health counselor, so I was more interested on gaining some, um, some of the micro skills, sharpening some of the micro skills um, of, of ACT. And I, I guess the question that I had um, with the online ACT guide is how, how effective is the online um, platform for self-guided um, ACT therapy when compared to um, utilizing ACT skills during a traditional counseling session with the client. Have you got data on that? That's a wonderful question and apologies. I tend to talk fast and there's like 80 things I wanna say about that, but I'll try to um, hit the key points. Um, I think of the evidence on a few levels. First, just is it effective to learn these on your own? In our own research, we've done about 30 clinical trials now that consistently show it is effective. So it has some meaningful impact on mental health. The broader literature shows that as well. And there's a quite robust literature. Um, the next step being kind of like how effective, um, we haven't done head-to-head -head comparisons with in-person therapy. Um, and um, I have seen one trial in ACT and it showed, I believe, pretty comparable effects, but there's a lot that goes into that kind of decision-making. Um, similarly, there's some meta-analyses showing it seems to perform uh, uh, close to the same effect size. 
And what that tells me is that, again, it's pretty robust. Um, we found with uh, what we based ActGuide on in a large trial, um, about 40% of people show good, reliable change for significant improvements in their mental health. Um, you know, the question of like, is it as effective as in, in person? I think it's more that portfolio of treatment options uh, idea. So it's more like it's going to reach new people. We see that we reach maybe another 20% of people who wouldn't normally seek help. Um, and then it does a lot adjunctively. So we've done a lot with things like put people on a wait list and we see a nice, sorry, when people are on the wait list at the counseling center, we see a nice improvement in mental health before they start therapy or, or afterwards or um, combining with a different treatment. So I think of it more from like that kind of access approach and broadening the scope and broadening the resources. Uh, although the research does show it's pretty robust in general, learning it in this format. Yeah, Mike, um, I want to ask you how people can get involved with ActGuide um, if they wanted to start using it. And then Judy and Maureen, after he answers, if you want to fill in how people could get involved with what you do. Wonderful. Yes. So um, through the Sorensen Legacy Foundation Center for Clinical Excellence, uh, we've developed ActGuide. And we, so if you go to our, that website, um, ActGuide is listed under teletherapy. And I'll try to post the URL in just a second in the chat, but it, it can't be directly copied in Zoom, just as an FYI. Um, and it's $10 per user. We try to keep the cost real low from an access perspective, and that just covers ongoing maintenance. It goes back through USU to have, a, for example, grad student help run it. Um, that said, if people are interested, you know, for referring their clients, if you want to just see it more as like a test account, feel free to just email me directly. I'm happy to give test accounts so you can vet it and, and get a feel for whether this might fit for the setting you're in. Judy? I think perhaps the best way to contact me right now is to go ahead and email me, judy.smith at usu.edu. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions and also point you to other opportunities around the state where there are therapeutic programs emerging or actually functioning. Yeah, and for music therapy, uh, people can definitely contact me directly here at the university. Our, our program at the university does sponsor several community events where people can be involved in music making experiences. If a person was interested in individual therapy with a music therapist, I would refer to them to the website for the Certification Board for Music Therapists, that's cbmt.org, where they can look up by state the therapists that are working in their state and contact them directly. For information relative to our program, just musictherapy.org is our national association. So, but always anyone can contact me here at the university. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now a question from Aurora Reyes um, from, Salt, from Salt Lake County <laughs> Behavioral Health. Aurora. Sorry, I was on mute. Oh, you're good. Um, I wanted to ask what your experiences have been working with clients through telehealth. So some kind of non-contact medium, whether WebEx or uh, Zoom. Um, and if you had any tips on how to improve that interaction for those of us that are still doing therapy, but mostly online. Yeah, Mike, I'm, I, I'm fairly sure that you've done Zoom sessions before. Um, and then Judy and Maureen, if you've done anything through the internet with horses and music, <laughs> feel free to chime oh. in. Yes. That's a great question and um, a, a few thoughts on it. Um, we've done uh, research trials with it and with our trainees um, and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, Dr. Mike Tuick, who I collaborate with um, uh, very actively. He's, uh, he's also tested this, for example, with adolescents with trichotillomania. And I'd say there's pros and cons, and I, I think everyone here can um, sort of resonate with that. Uh, you know, increased access, uh, people are more easily able to also uh, to seek services and also do it safely, importantly. 
um, but that we have more competing um, stimuli, like as we're in our natural homes. So um, the, the main tips I've heard from colleagues who uh, do a lot of this work is, you know, sort of setting up the environment and setting up expectations with the clients to have a good environment that's private, that they can focus. With the teens, Mike would tell me about um, a, a teen playing video games while they're <laughs> maybe supposed to be doing therapy. So there's some of that, that again, um, the uh, competing stimuli. I think there's just a challenge of Zoom fatigue that we're all facing um, that, you know, because we are doing a lot more on the screen to be mindful of that. I've heard, you know, more like eyes closed experiential exercises have a little more um, uh, utility in some ways because of that. And it's another way to kind of reach the client and practicing things like mindfulness. Um, so those are some quick tips from, from things I've seen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Michael KD has a question that I'm excited to hear the answer to. So Michael, if you're here. Yeah, this is actually, my name's in reverse. It's actually Kurt Michael. I'm a graduate. Oh. That, that's, that's fine. It, it happens every day. Um, anyway, I'm a graduate of USU uh, many moons ago, and a lot of my current work is in the K-12 schools and also in rural spaces. So I'm curious if any one of the panelists can comment on the work either in the rural space specifically or in K-12 schools. Well, what I have done in the past, which has been really exciting, is we incorporate horses in what we call our literacy project. So we look at those early readers and we inspire them with a horse themed book. We bring a horse to school, um, pass out those books, and it has some really nice supportive curriculum that it engages. Not only does it teach a desire of right reading skill, but it also teaches a little bit of equine science. So they kind of know what does the world of a horse look like. Um, and then it's followed up by a field day event where the students are able to come and go through a lot of different learning stations, all geared around understanding the horse better and just making that um, organic connection. You know, that's the lovely opportunity that I have is, you know, we're here out in a farm and it's just a very relaxed and organic experience that kind of helps speak to the need of less spring, you know, screen time. So that's a little experience of something that we weren't able to launch this fall to engage our local um, elementaries around us, um, but we're hoping to next fall. Yeah, Maureen, how do, how do you use music to help engage um, kids in school? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding the question why. Oh, I, what's the role of music therapy in schools? Absolutely. Um, it's used very much in a collaborative work with the special education teachers a lot of times where we are, we are dealing more with students that have an IEP or an individualized education plan in place. And we work hand in hand side by side with other um, professionals there in the school to address the student specific IEP goals. All right. And now another Michael, Michael Falland. Um, do you, are you ready to ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a question for Dr. Levin. So I was interested with the online self-guided intervention, you'd mentioned that, you know, one challenge is getting people to stick with it when you don't have kind of that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, I think you'd mentioned by bringing in coaches um, and, you know, offering support that can definitely help. But uh, I guess I have two questions. One, yeah, interested in more, ex maybe more concrete examples as to how you're able to get people to stick with it. Um, and from a social learning theory, you know, there's this idea of community of practice where um, basically the learners and the group are able to kind of offer support, go through that experience together. I was wondering, you know, if you've done something like that, is that possible to create that community of practice, even though, of course, the, the self-guided intervention is offered online? Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and let you answer. Thank you. A great question. Um, 
The, the most classic way, as I mentioned, was that kind of coaching protocol approach. This is often based more in research studies, which I get a little frustrated about in the terms of sustainability, scalability. It's like, okay, that worked in a study, but like now that I go into my treatment setting, like, okay, do I actually have coaches and how are they covered and billed for and things like that. Um, you know, certainly that could be something that's taken on by the care provider or within the team. Um, I've seen, for example, where you put this into primary care uh, and uh, for example, a nurse or a PA might be a contact point where they do some follow-up, but, but it's complicated to get in the workflow. So um, I've seen always some kind of tension there, um, especially because the whole idea is efficiency, cost savings with these self-guided resources, but now you have this clunky thing to deal with. Um, so um, one thing that we're testing now, uh, my grad student Corey Klimsack is uh, doing a study testing um, peer support coaching um, where we're actually having fellow USU students provide that coaching um, and that provides more scalability has a lot of benefits and starts to speak to I think what you were talking about uh, Michael um, with regards to like a learning community but I really like that approach maybe even more like a mutual support group um, someone else had mentioned like AA models and, and I think these types of models are so key for increasing access and destigmatizing so I think there's a lot more innovation that can happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I have a question for all three of our researchers, and I think I will make Judy go first. So get ready, Judy. But the question is, what's the one thing um, that you've learned from your work that you think that a lot of people could benefit from if they just started doing one thing? I think stepping back and taking a deep breath. Um, that's a habit that, especially when I engage a new horse and I need to convey to them I am not a threat, um, in that just stepping back, taking a deep breath, putting my problems behind me and just be in the moment and be present. We don't do that enough. Um, we need to make time for that kind of reflection and that time of sense of place and, 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 and detaching from all of our problems. Oh, that's nice. I was really stressed this morning getting ready for all of this. And I realized that I was listening to a podcast and I was like, what am I doing? And I ripped out my earbuds <laughs> and just did what I was supposed to do. Um, Maureen, what's one thing that you think people should start doing or could start doing? I think one thing I've seen that people actually have more strength within themselves than they realize that they have, that they have inner resources that maybe they haven't accessed yet and really are more courageous perhaps than they have given themselves credit for being. And I definitely agree that as we take the moment, take the time to just be present with ourselves and, and just still and listen, um, we can learn a lot from tapping into those inner resources that we all have. Okay, Mike. Oh, I, I want to say just I did out of both those. Those are fantastic thoughts and things I'm remembering to practice today. And uh, I guess if I was going to add one to that, um, we've lost a lot of opportunities for and uh, activities that really matter. I, I think just in navigating the pandemic, among other challenges we're facing right now, and um, being flexible about and coming back to like what really matters to me as more of like a life guide. So for example, I really value adventure. I used to travel a lot and that doesn't make sense now, but what are other ways I can bring some sense of adventure into my daily life as it's more restricted. So finding other ways to do the things that really matter to us and push past the inertia of that opportunity has gone. So I'm not going to do other things and, and see if you can find another way to grow your life. Um, especially as this goes on to, into months, I, I think that's just really critical. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then our last question is, what would you most like to see happen or are you thinking might happen in the next year and what's on your wish list for mental health? Um, and I want Mike, you to answer next and then we'll have Judy and then Maureen can finish us out. Sorry, in terms of like mental health uh, services or in, just broadly, got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I really hope we're on an upward trend of, you know, uh, there's been such big disruption from the pandemic, but there's really nice trends and um, accessibility that comes from technology and in just us, you know, being more mindful of taking care of each other, being compassionate of the challenges we're in, being flexible. And I really hope that as a, as a society, we keep moving in that direction because um, although mental health is, we talk about the individual level, it's a symptom of a lot of societal challenges in, in, in part. And so I think as a society, if we can be more compassionate, uh, there's a lot of good that can come of that. And I think 
perhaps it is good to remember that we are also a herd species. Community is very important. And, you know, walking among our therapy herd and the different relationships that transpire there and, and how interwoven they all are, you know, we, we need to take stock on that. And I think perhaps being forced home, we've been able to build some strong relationships, but then there's relationships in our lives that have, have struggled. And, and I think, you know, being um, I'm conscious of where those struggles are and, and being persistent and, and helping strengthening, strengthening those relationships, even though we are a little bit torn apart. And then one other thing that I would add to that is that how in navigating this pandemic, how people react to it is one thing that everybody is watching each other do. If we can take a step back, take a moment to breathe, connect with ourselves, and not panic is my wish here that we will get through this together. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, listeners, Wyatt, asked the question on RSVP about our children more um, responding more anxious to the event or the response that their parents and caregivers take to the event. I believe it's the latter. And so we as a society need to take a step back, not panic, know that we're in this together, and be strong in our relationships. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all. It's been so wonderful hearing all these questions and answers. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Barreau to finish out the meeting. Lisa. Thank you, Wyatt. And I'd like to say thank you first to our three speakers for sharing your insights and your research. Uh, I've truly enjoyed listening to you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank all of you who have joined us today for your time and also for your continued support of USU research. If you're interested in hearing more about the research uh, of these faculty members or other USU stories, please check out our podcast. It's called Instead and that's linked in the chat. We'd also like to hear your feedback about this first edition of Blue Plate Research. The survey link is also in your chat window and we'll expect that we'll be doing this yet for some time virtually. So we'd really like to continually improve. And so we really value your feedback. Our next Blue Plate Research event will be in January and it will be held virtually as well. The topic of that presentation will be fat and obesity with three more USU researchers uh, discussing topics from their areas of expertise. Those faculty members are going to be Maya Steele who's a kinesiology professor at our Brigham City campus who studies health-related bullying, Gabrielle Chicharkaida, who's a sociologist who examines societal determinants of obesity, and finally, Dale Wagner, who runs our body composition and exercise physiology labs. Thank you for being here today. Take care of yourself, your own health and well-being, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.